I've come to tell you that there is a trend in today's church that has got to change. And we have decided that there are people who are disposable. And I'm here to tell you that when God is at work in your life, you can't go around throwing folk out of your life. You've got to learn to reconcile godly relationships. You can forgive someone without reconciling the relationship, but if possible, reconciliation is always the more beautiful story. Hello and thanks for being with us now for today's Destined for Victory with Pastor Paul Shepard. And coming up next, Pastor Paul takes us to the story of Hannah, a barren woman who longs to have a child. As you follow along, pay close attention to how she handles a false accusation levied against her by the priest. It's a great reminder about the importance of grace and of reconciliation. Stay with us now or stop by our brand new website, PastorPaul.net, to listen anytime on demand. That's PastorPaul.net. Now here is Pastor Paul with today's Destined for Victory message, Kingdom First Living. Now, I've come to tell you that there is a trend in today's church that has got to change because there are a lot of people who, when we get into these kinds of situations of misunderstandings, there is this pattern in our world of disposable things. And we have decided that there are people who are disposable. And I'm here to tell you that when God is at work in your life, you can't go around throwing folk out of your life. When God is at work in your life, you've got to learn to reconcile godly relationships. So much so that the Bible says God doesn't even want to hear your praise and worship when you are disinterested and reconciling with your brothers and sisters. Oh, I'm going to prove it from the book. You leave here mad, you're going to be mad at the Bible because I'm just the mailman. Getting mad at the mailman because he brought a letter you don't like. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is giving us what we call the Sermon on the Mount. One of the most famous sermons in all of scripture when Jesus spoke on the mountainside to the multitudes. And we love so much about the Sermon on the Mount. We love the Beatitudes. Blessed are they that do this and that and that are in this state and that state. And we love that. Oh, yes. Thank God. Get happy on all that. Let your light shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. We say, oh, yes, thank God. Oh, but when he starts breaking it down as to what the blessed life looks like in day to day affairs, then sometimes folk go from, hey, man, that's right. to "Mm." You ever had a sermon where you started off, amen, and ended up, hmm. Because it's getting down to where you are. And that's what Jesus did on the Sermon on the Mount. Look at what he says, beginning at verse 21. You heard it said to people long ago, do not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. That's a mm point. Because Jesus throws you in the category with a murderer when you refuse to have a heart that wants to reconcile with a brother with whom you have a misunderstanding. Now see, that hurts our feelings because we want to think we're in a different category where it can't be that bad. Well, listen, Jesus is the one talking. And Jesus said, As far as I am concerned, you have the same heart as a murderer when you refuse to do the work of reconciling with others. So you've got to understand that the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. But then it says, and you must love your neighbor as yourself. This false spirituality that we have in today's world where folk think they are so close to God but can't stand you. So close to God, but soon as you offend them, they are gone. I'm here to tell you, it is not true spirituality. It is a religious spirit, but it is not after God's will. Because God's will is when people have offended you, when there is something separating brother or sister in Christ, you have got to have enough grace to go get it straight. And that takes work. And Jesus said, if you're not willing to do the work, 
He said, you are subject to judgment. Now, look at what he goes on and says. Verse 23, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Go first and be reconciled to your brother. Then come and offer your gift. Did you read that? He said, God is not trying to hear you when you don't want to get straight with the brother or sister he put you in the family with. God is not trying to hear you. He doesn't want to accept praise that is offered out of a heart that's closed to reconciling with other people. Oh, it's tight, but it's right. See, you want to come in. We have that brand of spirituality in today's world. We want to come in and sing and shout and act all so spiritual. All the while, we have these messy, unresolved issues with brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm here to tell you, it is not of God. And many of us are going to block our blessings until we're ready to go and deal with the stuff that is developing in our hearts. The Bible is very clear that agreement and unity is so important that Jesus prayed before he left this earth. We call the Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's not the Lord's Prayer, that's the prayer he taught us to pray. The Lord's Prayer is found in John 17. And what did Jesus say? Father, make them one. May they be brought into complete unity. Why? Because God knows that a united church is what it's going to take to reach people in this world for Christ. And so we've got to learn to deal with our stuff. And it takes work. The Bible talks about it over and over again as highly important. In the book of Philippians, Paul's writing this wonderful book from prison. And theologians call Philippians the joy book. Though he's in jail, his heart is overwhelmed with joy. He writes such a wonderful book to the church at Philippi. And we know and love many of the scriptures from it. People quote Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you shall bring it to completion. We quote Philippians 2, 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God. God who is at work in you, both the willing to do of his good pleasure. We quote Philippians later on where he says, you got to forget those things that are behind and press toward that which is ahead for the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ. We love all that. Hey, hallelujah. Look right in that same letter, in that same letter in chapter four, he's doing all this glorious exhorting and he stops and says, oh, by the way, There are two sisters in the church, calls their names and says, tell them to get their business straight. Right in the midst of all of that, unity is so important until he called them out in front of everybody and said, don't act like this in the family of God. No doubt these were women who were two influential women in the church. And no doubt their disagreement was having a trickle-down effect in the church. If you've been in the church any length of time, you know that when there's a fight, when there's a split, when there's a disagreement, when there are two sides, the church can break off into two gangs. I've been around church folk all my life. I've seen nobody can fight like church folk can fight. Oh, I've been to churches where they might as well sell tickets. It might as well be pay-per-view. I mean, I've seen some knockdown, drag out stuff in church. And Paul said, God is not going to get his work done in this fellowship until you all help these people get their business straight. Unity is important. Unity is essential. And I'm here to tell you that God wants us to learn how to deal with our differences. It takes hard work. Some of us have the tendency to be flighters. Some are fighters and some are flighters. And the fighters want to get down and handle their business without reconciliation. They just want to tell you off and then go. And then the flighters don't even want to deal with it. They just want to shy away and cut off fellowship. And God is saying, you've got to be mature enough and you've got to discern my will enough where you're willing to stop and deal with the issue. Had it happened very recently in our church. Several weeks ago, I was preaching the series, Got Fruit. I talked in one of the messages about the difference between 
genuine fruit that the Holy Spirit would develop in our lives and fake fruit. If you were here, you recall, I brought a bowl of fruit that appeared to be real from the audience. But in fact, it was fake fruit, but it looked good. We made sure to buy some that looked like the real thing. And I called some folk up who were hungry and they came up expecting to eat. And they came up, one brother bit into one of them. The teeth marks were right in there. I said, I can't use this in another service. <laughs> it looked good, but it was fake fruit. And I was talking about how in church, sometimes we develop a church entity that fosters fake fruit instead of genuine relationship with Christ and his spirit that will produce real fruit. And I talked about love and I said, there is genuine love, the agape love, but there is also this fake churchy love. We'll be right back with more of today's Destined for Victory message from Pastor Paul Shepard, Senior Pastor at Destiny Christian Fellowship in Fremont, California. If you enjoy listening to Destined for Victory, we know you'll love watching some of his best video clips by subscribing to Pastor Paul on YouTube. For more details on all of Pastor Paul's social media, scroll to the bottom of the homepage at our new website. The address is the same, pastorpaul.net. There you can always listen on demand to recent messages and find a variety of new features and resources. Again, pastorpaul.net. And stay with us after today's message when Pastor Paul joins me from his studio. First, let's find out more about how to handle misunderstandings and hurt feelings God's way. With the rest of today's message, Kingdom First Living, here is Pastor Paul Shepard. I talked about people with this fake churchy grin and this God bless you veneer and hallelujah and smile. And I talked about how I hate that. I've seen it so much in people who by their later actions, it's clear it's not the love of God. And I talked about, I've seen people who say, I love you and smile at you. And then you walk away and they call you heifer. You remember that? Well, days after that, there was a message in my office for me, and it was from one of the brothers in the church. And he said, Pastor, I know you're very busy, but this is truly urgent. And this is just between you and I. And so, you know, I need you to call me, not one of the other pastoral members. Would you please take a moment and get in touch with me? There's something that you and I have to talk about. And so I know this brother and I knew that he wouldn't disturb me for something petty. And I called him and he is one of the most loving people in this church. God uses him with a gift of encouragement and affirmation. He is one of our greeters and the ushers and he hugs folk and loves on people. And he just has a gift of that. And when he heard me preach that message and talk about this grin and smile, without really focusing on the picture I was painting of the false fruit and how a person would then, by the thing they said when you walk away, show that they don't have the right heart. He just heard the grin and smile part and knew he grins and smiles. And he said, I wondered, were you talking about me? Now, here's the point. He could have assumed that I was talking about him. You see what I'm saying? He could have said, well, I'm the grinning this person in the church. And a whole lot of folk know how I greet people. I'm known to be the loving greeter in this church. And so he got to be talking about me. And then he could have taken offense in his heart and alienated himself in his heart from me and said, I don't want anything else to do. I've done nothing but try to help him build that ministry so that the folk will feel good when he gets ready to feed him the word of God. I've been his partner in ministry with him. I've been serving with him and he got the nerve. If he got something to say to me, look like he would come to me like a man. Walk up on me like a man and say, I got a problem with how much you grin. I'm sick of seeing your teeth all the time. He could have gone there. He could have developed a whole attitude. Not only that, but then he could have then taken it as his mission to get other folk to think I'm not right. Oh, I'm preaching and you don't know it. And then he could have decided I'm now his enemy. And my goal is to expose the fact that I know they think he all anointed and wonderful, but I know him. You ever seen somebody who sour on somebody else? 
And when other people start singing the praises of somebody that's a blessing in their life, their whole face changes. And they say, mm, you don't know. You don't know like I know. Let me, let, when I get through talking to you in the next few minutes, he could have gone there. What did he do? He picked up the phone and said, Pastor, were you talking about me? That's the only way you can stay reconciled. You've got to be willing to go there, wherever there is. You've got to be willing to go there. You've got to be willing to ask the question, were you inferring that I need to change my style? And because he brought it to me, I was able to apologize profusely. Say, oh no, brother, you are one of the most genuine lovers in this church. God uses you in a mighty way. You better not stop doing what you do. You've got a pure heart. People who know you know that. I've never heard anything about you disrespecting people. And so thank God for you. I was able to to build him up and affirm him and to share with him that you are vitally important to what God is doing in this church. So that when we got through with this short conversation, he and I were more in sync than ever. That's what God wants in your life and mine. He wants you to realize that you need people in your life. You need folk. And let me tell you something. God will cause you to need them in the same kind of way that Hannah needed this man. You need somebody who will pray you out of your trouble. Who will agree with God with you in your difficulty. You need people who will help you get your prayer through. Let me tell Christian couples something. You got to work hard at staying in sync. Because Peter said, if you don't, your prayers will be hindered. Right in the book, that if couples don't operate, dwell with each other according to knowledge, and deal with these things, he said, your prayers will be hindered. And I'm here to tell you that sometimes Christians want to act all holy at church, but your spouse said, I wish you'd be a little bit holy at home. <laughs> you're going around and encouraging other people, and every now and then I need encouragement. And you're ignoring me. And God says, we've got to learn to value the people he's brought into our lives because you need them to help you get through. And as a result of Hannah handling this right, look at the result. She's reconciled with this man. Because she handled it right, after she explained it to him, look at Eli, verse 17. He answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. See, that's what she needs. She needs this man to be on her team. She needs this man to be on her side. She needs this man to be saying, yes, God, in the name of the Lord, I pray that you would give this woman a son. And I'm here to tell you that God is going to bring some blessings into your life, but not if you are disrespecting and dishonoring others in the body of Christ. You've got to discern the importance of the body. You who are married, you've got to discern the importance of the role your spouse plays in keeping you unified toward what God is doing in your life. And you can't ignore them and call yourself blessed of the Lord. You've got to learn to unify and work through your differences. You know how that happens in the married life. It's easy to just alienate yourself. But you have to learn to be big enough to say, listen, when you said that the other day, that really hurt me. And you got to stop and talk and give grace. You know, we got to get back into the pattern, whether you're talking about a marriage or talking about fellowship in the church, of just extending grace to people. We got to get back to the business of saying, if you're going to be presumptuous, presume the best. If you're going to be presumptuous, presume the best. When somebody says something a little harsh, say to yourself, they didn't mean that like that. That sounded a little raw, but they're probably just having a little bad day. I'm going to cover that. It's blessed of the Lord when you learn to cover people. You know why that's a blessing? Because God covers you all day. All day long, God's got you covered. All day long, God says, I know your heart. You're not acting too cool right now, but I know your heart. And I'm just going to cover that while I keep growing you up, while I help you get where I'm taking you. In the meantime, I'm going to cover. So you need to act like God's grace to you is giving you the ability to cover other folk. When your spouse speaks harshly to you, you say, no, no, they didn't really mean that. I got that covered. 
When a brother or sister in your meeting, your usher's meeting or whatever it is, says something a little wrong and makes you feel bad, if you can, cover it. Now, the proof that it's covered is you can send it away and you don't even have to have a talk and you stay connected with them. Now, if you can't do that, and the proof is when you see them, you still feel the offense. You know what I'm talking about? One of the old mothers in the church I grew up in, she called that bosom trouble. When you see a person, you have bosom trouble. That means every time you see them, the last thing they said that hurts you is still very present. And maybe you tried to cover it, maybe you tried to forget it, but it's still there. When you have bosom trouble, then that means you got to have a talk. Because that's the only way you can get it out. Matthew 18, Jesus said, your brother or sister offend you, go and show them their fault. To them alone. Don't talk about it to all these other folk. They weren't there. Why are you asking questions of people who can't answer them? What do you think she meant saying that to me? How they know? You have to go to the offender and say, when you said such and such a thing, what did you mean? Go and show and get reconciled. That's the blessed life. That's the life God can send his blessings into. People who keep short accounts. People who refuse to carry baggage. I got enough trials I got to go through. I don't need to carry you as a trial. I'm going to keep short accounts with people. Forgive them when I can. Cover them when I can. And when I need to have a talk, get it out there. And brothers and sisters, if we will learn to deal with our misunderstandings with well-intentioned people in the way that Hannah did, we will keep our hearts and minds clear so that the blessings of the Lord can flow. Thanks so much for being here for today's Destined for Victory message, Kingdom First Living. And I'm pleased to welcome Pastor Paul, who joins me from his studio in California. Pastor, many of us put some real thought into what we name our children, our businesses, even our pets. Many of our listeners have wondered how we got our name, Destin for Victory. Let's talk about that for a moment as we wrap up today's broadcast. Well, I really take Paul seriously when he said God began a good work in us and he's going to bring it to completion, which means our lives are journeys. All of us are somewhere in our journey, not only of chronological time, but we're on a spiritual journey. I want to make sure that I help you navigate well on your spiritual journey. I want to make sure that I help people avoid pitfalls where possible, or at least learn that they don't have to be fatal. I know what it is to have failure in my life, but I also know what it is that failure doesn't have to be final. If people will put their trust in God, repent when they mess up, and let the Lord restore us and make us the people he's destined us to be. The fact of the matter is, if God be for us, it doesn't matter who or what is against us. We're going to get to that place of ultimate victory in Christ. Well, we do say it all the time here. In Christ, you are destined for victory. God said it, and we believe it. Destined for Victory is only made possible through the faithful prayer and financial support of friends like you. And today, when you send a generous gift to Destined for Victory, we'll gladly send you Pastor Paul Shepard's message, When the Unexpected Happens, as our way of saying thanks. This video gift is available on DVD or as an on-demand streaming option. This is the final day of this special offer, so contact us right away. Call 855-339-5500 or visit PastorPaul.net to make a safe and secure donation online. You can also mail your gift to Destin for Victory, Post Office Box 1767, Fremont, California, 94538. We are called to be people of purpose and destiny. But destiny doesn't mean you don't have to deal with dysfunction. Destiny means you need to have the courage to confront some things and say, you know what? I want God to be honored, not just in spite of, but I want him to be honored because. And that's tomorrow in Pastor Paul Shepard's message, Destined but Dysfunctional. Until then, remember, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. In Christ, you are destined for victory.